Chapter 20 Ellie was mentally drained. For two days, Istaga had worked her hard, trying to teach her how to better control her magic. The elderly Fablin had allowed brief breaks for eating, during which she had provided odd-looking meals with ingredients that Ellie didn't want to think about. But the practice had been non-stop. At night, Istaga had shown her to a lovely bedroom, with a bed that seemed to be made of silk, but she had been woken early to continue her learning. Two days had been agreed, two days had gone, and Ellie didn't feel like she had learned nearly enough. Istaga was patient in her teaching, explaining that she was learning too. The only experience she had of human magic was from her nephew Merlin, but she had been only a child by Fablin's standards, and had understood little of his magic. She explained that human magic was chaotic, and what Ellie had to learn to do was to direct the chaos, and control the flow, to be able to target her magic to the exact amount she wanted. She told Ellie that Merlin had learned to master it, eventually being able to blend fine threads of different forms of chaos with such control that he could create. After two days of constant practice, Ellie could just about summon magic when she desired. At first she had not been able to control the type of chaos summoned. Istaga had explained that the traces of fairy and goblin blood in her triggered the magical ability, and that ability allowed her to unleash chaotic forms of elemental forces, earth, wind, water, fire, and lightning. At the end of the first day of Astaga's guidance and gentle tutoring, Ellie was just about able to summon magic when she concentrated, but it was in no way controlled. It could be a tiny lick of flame, or an enormous whirlwind. Ellie did not know how to control which force she summoned, nor could she control the strength with which it was released. It was also a struggle for Ellie to make it stop. Her lack of control had meant that the practice took place outside of the settlement, where the wild magic would not harm anyone. Fortunately, Istaga's mastery of magic allowed the Fablin to contain some of the most explosive magic that burst forth from Ellie's wand. But each time magic flowed through her, seeming to come from everywhere around her, it felt more familiar. With the familiarity came a little understanding of how each element felt. She focused on that feeling, and by late morning of the second day, Ellie could control which force of nature she summoned. But once she summoned it, she could not control how powerful it was, or how long it lasted, although it was usually only a few seconds. Those seconds, with raw power flowing through her, were both exciting and terrifying. When it stopped, she felt tired. But a few minutes rest and perhaps a bite of sweet juicy comample, and she was soon ready to try again. Rake, Fliss and Blake attended nearly all of her lessons, although Blake missed a few to fly around on his clumsy pigeon. They listened intently, and during one of their breaks Fliss told Ellie that Istaga knew many things, things that they had not been taught in their own magical educations. They too were learning, refining their abilities, practicing nearly as much as Ellie was. They also told her with excitement that they were amazed at how fast she learned, Ellie had been disappointed not to master a single spell, but they told her with a tone of awe that fairy children could take months, even years, to learn as much as she had in two days. Ellie felt a lot better at hearing that, but Istaga had at no time seemed impressed, continuing in the same tone with which she had started. The two days had gone and the third day had dawned. Istaga brought her another strange breakfast that she started to describe. The first ingredient was mushrooms, which sounded promising. But when the second ingredient was caterpillars, Ellie asked her to stop and resigned herself to eating it, out of politeness more than hunger. Istaga implored her to stay, and Fliss seemed to support the idea. Just one more day, perhaps, she suggested. The explorer fairy seemed to be learning more from Istaga than anyone, but Rake didn't seem so sure, pointing out that if they were going to rescue Duncan, each day they waited meant that he might complete his time in the training camps and be sent to battle. Ellie knew he was right. She thanked Astaga for the lessons and asked her once more to help her find a brother, to fulfil her part of the agreement. I will of course help you, as I said I would. I would prefer you stay longer to allow me to help you master your potential. But if you insist on leaving today, I shall provide you with a guide. He will be arriving shortly. I instructed him to come after breakfast. Who is he? Rake asked, at the same time as Fliss asked. To where will he guide us? Istaga smiled. He will take you wherever you want to go, if it is within his knowledge and ability. As to where you should go, we will discuss that when he arrives. He should be here any moment. 
As if summoned by her, there was almost instantly two quick knocks at the door. Istaga didn't move, but neither did the visitor wait for a response. The door opened, and in walked a goblin. Ellie felt herself shift nervously, and it seemed like Rake and Blake did too. But Fliss only looked on with curiosity, and Ellie reminded herself that she was in a fable in town, and there were many goblins here, living peaceful lives with fairies and fablins alike. Good morning, all, the goblin greeted. He sounded very cheerful, despite the screechy nasal voice giving it an uncomfortable undertone. Nice to meet you. I'm Figwap, he introduced himself. Nobody said anything. Ellie hadn't expected a goblin. She didn't know what she had expected. Who better than a goblin to lead us into goblin lands? She asked herself the obvious question. Figwap didn't seem bothered by the silence. A smile fixed on his face as he strolled over to them and offered a hand. You must be Ellie. Istaga has told me that you are her great-niece or something like that. Well, any relative of Istaga's is a friend of mine. She gently extended a hand towards the goblin. He took it and shook it enthusiastically. For some reason she had expected his skin to be different in some way, perhaps cold or slimy or sticky, but it was a warm hand, a comforting grip, and Ellie found herself smiling at the goblin, despite the sharp goblin features and her bad experiences with goblins so far. You'll show us where the training camps are for the human boys? In goblin lands? She asked. I will show you wherever you wish to go. Although, Istaga suggested you might be interested in going to the Valley of Mel before heading north to the Mokhtar Mountains. The goblin looked with mild confusion from Ellie to Istaga and back again. Istaga cleared her throat before speaking. Perhaps. It is a decision for Ellie to make. The Valley of Merle is a dark area, in the foothills of the Colossus Mountains. It is a dangerous place, protected by magic that prevents any being from entering the valley. The spells that protect the valley were placed there by Merlin, because it was his home when he was in this world. The magic has survived him, somehow but I believe that it is protecting something, and I think that he intended for it to be reclaimed by someone one day. I think that perhaps that day has come, and maybe Merlin intended for you to go there. More information that had been kept back by Istaga. Ellie didn't know what to do. More complications added to her plan. She had only wanted to rescue her brother, Then she had somehow got involved in a war between the goblins and the fairies. Now she was finding out about her ancient relatives, who may or may not have left something for her in a magically protected valley. These were obstacles that she did not need. Fliss stepped forward to speak. I've heard of the Valley of Mel, but I wasn't sure if it was real. Have you been there? The question seemed addressed to both Figwap and Istaga. Figwap answered first, cheerily. I've been to the edge. As far as anyone has gone, or can go, I've felt the intense sense of fear and danger that makes each step more difficult. I've seen the wall of writhing thorn bushes that would shred anything that approached, and the thick fog beyond, which no one could navigate. I can take you to it, but not lead you in. Istaga spoke next, and all eyes swung to her in curiosity. I've been to the valley. Into the house that Merlin built in the human style. Figwap gasped at the revelation, which Istaga ignored and continued. Of course, that was a long time ago, when I was a child and Merlin was still alive, and had not yet cast the spells that sealed the valley. In the centuries since, I too have been to the edge a few times, but the magic is too different from my own. I do not know how to dispel it, and I could offer little advice. However, I do have a strong feeling that it was meant for you, Ellie, that it will help prepare you for the trials ahead. If that is the case, Merlin would have left a way for you, and you alone, to free the valley of its curse. Rake burst into the conversation then, speaking to Istaga in exasperation. A feeling! You have a feeling that Ellie might be able to find a way to get into a cursed valley, where there might be some unknown object waiting for her. Then he addressed Ellie. 
we can't keep on delaying. If we don't find your brother while he's still in the training camps, he could be assigned to anywhere and we may never find him. Ellie responded at last, grateful that Rake had said what she knew to be true. I agree. Once we've rescued Duncan, maybe we will visit the Valley of Mel. If we have time, I mean. Istaga raised her eyebrows, looking at them. I believe that if you do not visit the valley first, your search for your brother will fail. Then she turned her gaze on Rake and spoke with a warning tone. My feelings have served me well for over a thousand years, and have provided sound advice for many. Remember, you came to me for advice, and I have given it. Then she disappeared. She didn't make a portal. There was no puff of smoke or anything. She was just... gone. Ellie stared open-mouthed at the spot that had been vacated by the ancient Fablin. Figwop just shrugged. She does that sometimes, when she gets in a mood. But she's right about her feelings. They're never wrong. Istaga's advice has always been invaluable to me. I think we should go to the Valley of Mel. Fliss added, making the decision even more difficult. Things are never simple anymore, thought Ellie, 